Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Sami. So we'll move to Dr. Raid Qatshan from uh, Saudi Arabia, interventional cardiologist. Who's your enemy? Enemy? He said identifying. I am your enemy. No, not. No, not. Oh, oh, shall. Take it off. Um, so, Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Gulf Interventional Society for the great opportunity. Thank you, Fawaz, Abdullah, Dr. Musa, for uh, really uh, a great job that you are doing for our uh, uh, society. So, our case today, um, it's like in a discussion. We will discuss all of us uh, who's the enemy. <coughs> so, our hero. Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali is a 44-year-old gentleman working as a security officer brought to the emergency department with a severe chest pain, progressively increased over the last five days, associated with shortness of breath, drenching, sweating. While our colleague in the ER uh, doing their job, taking the uh, initial workup, let's travel back in the history uh, of Mr. Ali and have more details about his past medical history. So first of all, Mr. Ali had a head injury early in his childhood that left him with an expressive language disorder, problem in psychosocial function. He lives alone, not married, and he has capacity to give consent and discuss a treatment plan. And this point is very important in the coming point in his case. He's diabetic, diagnosed early in his 30s, like more than 10 years ago. He's an oral hypoglycemic agent, not a regular follow-up, and his hemoglobin A1C between 8.5 to 9, early stages of diabetic nephropathy and diabetic retinopathy. Hypertensive, again diagnosed in the same time that he had the diabetes. He's on valsartan with hydrochlorothiazide, codiuban, and pisoprolol, relatively controlled. He's habal epidemic, diagnosed in 2018. His physician managed to convince him to be on a, a torvastatin 80 milligram and this is to my 10 milligram. Um, and he reached the target LDL less than 0.5. Ischemic heart disease. And uh, the first diagnosis of ischemic heart disease was in eight, eight, 2018 and his first coronary angiography in 2019. You are lucky here that you could have some more data about his ischemic heart disease before taking him to the cath lab. So uh, going back to the story, I uh, started at 2019 in Hospital A. The first coronary angiogram done for this patient, diagnosed to have triple vessel disease, no actually clear data regarding did they discuss with him um, a cabbage as an option or no? But whatever, he ended by a multivessel uh, PCI, one drug eluting stent to LED, another one to CERC, another one to the RCA, and no cath uh, report or angio is available for us. So uh, even they managed to convince him to stop smoking in 2019, Still, at the end of 2019, Mr. Ali still had a chest pain, and he chose to change his physician. So he went to Hospital B. In Hospital B, they did an elective admission for him as a case of unstable angina, which he ended by another drug eluting stent to the LED. Um, as in the medical report, because there is an, a, a new lesion distal to the previous stent. The company that he worked for changed the insurance company. So the new insurance company is not covering Hospital B or Hospital A. And they shift him to Hospital C. He presented to the emergency department of Hospital C with an uh, active chest pain, which diagnosed as a nasty elevation in my coronary angiography done there. LED had a patent to previous stent, followed by a focal 80% lesion, 
then total occlusion, left cerc, osteal instant, restenosis, RCA, had a patent proximal stent with a distal focal lesion. RCA is giving collateral to the left system. So he end by a PCI to the totally occluded LAD with another drug eluting stent and one drug coated balloon, PCI to the RCA with another drug eluting stent. Then readmitted in a hospital C again for as an elective for a staging for the ISR on the CERC. So he had another PCI to the left CERC with one drug eluting stent more. In that period, he had a COVID positive and admitted for that while discharged, then he received the vaccine. 2021, presented to the ER of Hospital D this time. Again, the insurance company guided that. Here, we had uh, now a coronary angio from Hospital D. So you can see the previous stand on the CERC, on the LED, critical, ISR, at the proximal part of the stand. The flow in the CERC is, uh, is really um, affected, critical ISR. The two stents on the CERC proximal and distal here, it's patent, whatever there is, a kind of ISR. And RCA giving a good retrograde filling to the left system. Okay, so uh, they start doing a multiple BTCA uh, all over the previous stent on the LAD. Proximal to this stent and even BTCA to the CERC, more BTCA to the LED. Dissection happened. It's more clear now distal to the previous stent, managed by another stent. No flow now distally in the LED. Anyhow, um, started on a dowel antiplatelet therapy and uh, um, uh, on top of his other medication and discharge home. He had the second dose of vaccine. I'm mentioning that because um, they mentioned in, in some of the medical reports that patient get admitted uh, like two or three weeks after the vaccine. But I don't think the vaccine had a relation here. We will see, maybe it's the enemy. So Mr. Ali is not happy now with what happened with the hospital D, so he changed to hospital E. In hospital E, he presented to them, but this time, is, again, it's not elective admission. He was admitted as a case of non ST elevation MI. And this time, the hospital is governmental, so the insurance company had no relation. So his RCA stent is patent, giving retrograde filling to the lift system. Now the uh, ISR is more critical on the LED and even on the CERC. Multiple BTCA ballooning. You can see that the edges here, the borders of the stent I'm not sure there is no IVAS or any kind of imaging, but the borders of the stent from the end you look like a regular, and I'm, I'm not sure if the deployment was, okay, whatever, it's a multiple layer of stent here. Multiple 
multiple BTCA, no flow distally, or whatever, they uh, recover the diagonal branch flow. And now there is a kind of flow dissection and the flow to the distal of the LAD. I'm not sure what's this, it's the dissection or even there is a kind of thrombosis, whatever. They continue doing a BTCA and uh, now to the circ. So the flow is better in the circ. and they finalized with a multiple drug-coated balloon. So it was um, a three drug-coated balloon to the LED, a one drug-coated balloon to the lift circ. With a good flow actually in the circ, but the LED um, after the dissection area is not that good. Okay, so he was discharged. There was an uh, uh, LV clot at that time, so the patient was discharged in a triple therapy, uh, which was complicated by epistaxis. So Mr. Ali was not happy with that, so he stopped all the three medication: aspirin, um, ticagrelol, and uh, uh, duac. So he presented after that. What way we go? To Hospital E as an emergency admission with an anesthemy again. <clears throat> that was almost like four months after the previous admission. You can see here that the ISR is everywhere, stent stenosis everywhere in a very short period, but some of this period was without double antiplatelet therapy. Right system is still working and giving a collateral. So here the patient offered cabbage. The treating physician decided to send him for urgent cabbage, but patient refused and he signed DAMA. And not even he signed DAMA, he escaped from the hospital at night because as we start with, he had a psychosocial problem. Now, we go back to our colleague in the emergency department. The initial ECG is ready now. He had the STT changes of ischemia all over the ECG. He looked irritable and severe chest pain <clears throat> with a bending cardiogenic shock manifestation, had a pansystolic murmur over the cardiac apex. Bedside equidan showed a left ventricular systolic function severely reduced, almost 25 to 30%, multiple uh, regional wall motion abnormality with a preserved thickness, and um, had a uh, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. His current medication is Entresto, um, nitrate, 10 milligram BID beta blocker, um, uh, isotomide, and Atorvastatin and Ticagrulol. So, cath lab activated. That was almost um, like a 
seven days from the previous coronary angio and the previous hospital that he left. So you can see that no flow on the lift system, either on the LED or the CERC. So multiple BTCA, again, to establish the kind of flow. Patient was, uh, at this moment, in anthropes. Um, he was in a bending cardiogenic shock. A Grastat infusion started, and he loaded again because, actually, the story uh, the history regarding the double antiplatelet therapy is not clear. So loaded again, agrostat infusion, um, multiple BTCA, the flow is gained again. He starts to be um, um, out of chest pain relatively. A higher uh, high, pressure, high pressure ballooning staging technique uh, with the multiple size increasing gradually, um, multiple BTCA all over both of uh, LED and SARC. Better flow now, at least the SARC. Transfer to the CCU, no anthropes of vasopressors, stable vital signs, no schist pain, agrostat infusion, low molecular weight heparin, double antiplatelet therapy, heart team discussion, decided to send him for urgent cabbage, uh, where the mitral valve replacement, because of the situation of the patient, a team decided to transfer him hospital to hospital. Um, and they did their further imaging and viability study and uh, cabbage done and mitral valve replacement. Um, so for Mr. Ali, really it's tough to, uh, to, to say, but uh, recognizing who is the real enemy here and now Dr. Abdullah, who is the enemy of Ali? I think, the, thank you very much, by the way, excellent uh, to share with us a horror, I think, uh, <laughs> case well, I, it's uh, very interesting to see maybe I, I feel that the same operator moving from uh, you know hospital C to D to E doing the same thing again and again any comments from the audience the panelists want to say something you have a first of all thank you so much it's a very very uh, challenging case you know and very tough case uh, just a few things you know I uh, always like to recommend when I have such a case. For, you know, it is a must for me when I have a case of instant stenosis to do IBUS. Very important, you know, you need to collect information, you need to know why this happened, you know, you need to make sure that this will not happen again, otherwise we don't learn the lesson from the first time. Uh, second, you know, uh, I have, I am not understanding, you know, usually if a patient has instant Restenosis in one artery, you will have in the other arts, but in your case, you did not have in the right one. You have also only in the left system, which makes me think about some technical reasons behind that. You know? So that's another indication to do. I was to understand if the stent is well deployed, if there's any problem with the size of the stent, you know, information like this. Using drug diluting balloon. Is always a better idea uh, than uh, putting another stent. But before putting uh, the blood coated, uh, the balloon coated balloon, you need to prepare the region very well. You need to, to open the artery, you know, properly by using either you know, a scoring balloon or cutting balloon, you know, to make sure that you know the medicine will penetrate, will go inside the. The, the, the artery wall and it will work 
well. And then if, if you do all this and still you have instant stenosis, then maybe we should consider a brachytherapy. This is the, the last resort of that. You refer the patient to a center which he has brachytherapy. I'm not aware if there's any center in the Gulf here doing that. You know, if there's any, I would like to, to know. Okay, let me um, take, let's take. Before we go to the second question, uh, what you mentioned is really very nice. But I think we have to discuss in our meeting the reality, which is the reality in the private. It's not your decision to do IVAS or not. It's the decision of the insurance company. When I discuss with some of my colleagues, and by the way, A, B, C, D is a private hospital. E and the last one is governmental. Any kind of imaging, no imaging, because first of all, the insurance company, uh, most of the time they didn't pay for FFR, IFR, IVAS, and they ask for justification. And the justification is difficult. And the interventionist is squeezed. Either he just do it and include it in, 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 in the tire of the case, or he will be blamed by the hospital but by, by the authority of the, um, of the hospital itself. So, you know, the reality is a little bit complicated. Yeah, you are right, but you know, this is not an excuse. We, we, I, we, insurance is another challenge in our practice nowadays, but you have to insist. If I have a patient who needs rotavation angioplasty and uh, I postpone the case till I get the approval, I might take one day or two days or three days to get approval for rotavation angioplasty, but I insist and I send one, two, three reports. I discuss with the insurance till they approve it. You know, I will not go and do something that I'm not convinced just because the insurance, and if I don't have the facility in my institution, I will ask help from another institution because at the end of the day, you need the benefit of the patient. Okay, you know, let's not make, just to do any service. Let's make the comments uh, brief and please go ahead then, Ali. questions. The first is that uh, when was the guidelines saying that this patient needed a cabbage? Because he passed by four or five hospitals and you said that three or four of them were private followed by a governmental hospital. Uh, if we are following what we call uh, guidelines, then uh, those guidelines should be implemented in any hospital, whether it's private or public. And the benefit for the patient should be selected because, uh, I'm sorry to say, we might consider this like malpractice. I know each and every doctor is trying to do the best for the patient, but when you find that, number one, there was something which looked like technical uh, problem or stent failure, or mechanical, and it's repeated. And whenever, each and every time you repeat it, we didn't get any better result. And definitely through this time, ejection fraction was decreasing. So. What's the clear indication that this patient should need a cabbage? And if the patient is refusing, what's our role as doctors who've seen such patients to explain to the patient that your best choice is this? And if not, then I should not be involved in doing a procedure which was a failure previously in two, three, four, five hospitals. Yes. At what stage you've taken this patient? At the beginning, you've taken this patient to do a bypass? In You're the, a surgeon, no in, the, yeah, surgeon. in the first diagnostic cath, they should be referred to the surgeon. And definitely in that hospital, they did try to do this. However, the patient refused. Uh -huh. The point that I'm questioning is, if the patient refuses, how can we convince him that evidence-based medicine says this and that? That's the different point. And the second point that you just said about the insurance is definitely not an excuse. Because we have to convince the insurance that this is the right thing to do to the patient not because they're saying it's easier to do another uh, CAG and put another stent, and it's a failure repeatedly four times. So Walid then Ali. Walid. Yeah. Please, yes. please, go. Thank you. Um, so um, just Dr. Abdullah, comment. just if I can answer. Uh, yes, um, um, I agree with you, but uh, you know, Dr. Yasser, we used to speak about uh, the, the, uh, the ideal things, but as an interventionist, most of us, uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw the same scenario many times, but we never discussed that in a meeting. And really, uh, I think a lot before I bring this case, because yes, there is a failure to, uh, to get with the guideline. Maybe I think if I'm the physician in the hospital A, I will send him, I will convince him to go to the cabbage by that time. 
being diabetic, young age, a lot of factors. So, but when the virtuous cycle started, it never end. Um, the reality, again, yes, we can speak theoretically that we will never do and we will never uh, um, uh, accept and we should guide the insurance company. But the reality, you see, the insurance company even could change the physician for the patient. They shift him from hospital B to C and another. Okay. Brief, so, please, then, so we can... Yeah, so, so just to comment a bit on the cabbage thing, um, uh, sometimes it's very challenging to convince a patient to go for a cabbage. And what he does is he shops around and he finds the answer that he likes. So a physician will come to him and he'll tell him, okay, I can stand it, and it's done. So it's very, very, very challenging to convince him with cabbage. And then just to touch upon a lot of the things that you mentioned was correct, like we need to do imaging. Uh, it's, it's like a, a, a critical in these kind of scenarios. And I think it's also very important that we have brachytherapy in our uh, region. Uh, maybe each country should have it. I think it's essential. We've, I've, we've encountered a lot of issues with ISR, uh, not related to technical issues. Maybe in this case, there, there was definitely a technical issue, whether it was a stent size or underexpanded stent. Uh, Drug-coated balloons, they have their limitations, but I think brachytherapy would have been um, probably essential here. Just, uh, I accept the first, uh, sir, uh, the first intervention and the second intervention, but starting from the third intervention, the doctor should have looked and uh, d discussed that we are facing with what we call diffuse instant uh, restenosis. That's a totally different pathology. That's a uh, new intimal hyperplasia. And with, it's, got, it's not going to work doing just balloon dilation or that. At least debulking should have been done. And I haven't seen that from the third or, or that, is, uh, whether it was directional, with laser, or rotablator. But I think debulking was the main issue here because of significant yeah. new intimal hyperplasia. And Nesenheim did it done. And it's expected to keep coming again and again. Yeah, so I, I like that dy dy it's dynamic should be there. It should not just because of at the beginning you said not for cabbage, halas. No, you need to revisit your patients. So, Dr. Omar? Uh, quickly, thank you for a great presentation, actually, very thorough. And uh, I, I think was, when you start doing a lot of cases, you know there is patient reject stent, stent rejection. That's what we see. You have patient, you put a stent, 10 years, the stent is wide open, and you have a stent, patient, you put a stent, two, three months is closed. So those, this patient, I tell you, he does not like stent. Putting more stent is adding more foreign body in his heart. I agree that this patient has to be referred early. Now the question is, I think we have to get the patient to see the cardiac surgeon, less study, uh, I mean, listen from the cardiac surgeon, not from us. I think that's where the problem is. If the cardiac surgeon sit, to the, sit with the patient, I think more likely going to, to convince. Number two, this particular patient is non-compliant. And, and this is, I'm glad you mentioned his psychology. That is a patient you should not put stand to start with. That patient should be referred to the cabbage from the very first beginning. And this is they did first time and that reoccur. Re re so I think this patient was, um, need to be re revisit the whole thing as open heart surgery have to be offered by the cardiac surgeon in the very early stages. Yeah, not because patient refused cabbage, we should go with the PCI. I think that's another thing. Adela. Just a quick last two comments. First of all, thank you for presenting well, a very I'm difficult done. case. Nobody wants to present such a mm. complicated case, but good for you. Uh, to be honest, I think maybe against some of the comments, but I think PCI is the first time was not, a, was not an issue. I don't, I don't think it's not the right thing to do. I think it's an option to do PCI is the first option the first presentation but now because we saw what happened it's easy to say not but I think the, fa the second time he had restenosis restenosis then bypass is, is of course the option the, the the main thing I wanted to mention is that one of the procedures he had a stent put in the mid LED and there was no flow in the LED and that's a no no I think that should not have happened and I think that's a learning message great Dr. Rai thank you very much for your presentation so who is the enemy huh who is the enemy all of us <laughs> Perfectly. I think your talk now. <laughs>